Now this is week four of Uncommon because we have an uncommon God who gives us uncommon strength to live an uncommon life. And if you've missed any of the first three weeks, go back and watch because we broke down all three uh, of those statements. Now today for week four, we're gonna pivot a little bit And we're gonna start getting really practical in this series. We're gonna start talking about, hey, what does this mean for our Monday? Starting today with a sermon I wanna preach out of Numbers chapter 13. If you wanna beat me there, I'll meet you there in just a couple of minutes. I think this word's gonna challenge us and inspire us. And so let's pray, Lord, we love you. We thank you that you are an uncommon God and that we are called to be an uncommon church. Help us do that now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You can take a seat. You ever had a aha moment? Uh, A moment where somebody like connects two dots in your mind that you didn't know needed to be connected? Uh, I had one of those moments about a year ago. I was at my friend Oliver's house. He was having a little barbecue and uh, the kids were all in in the pool and all the adults were around the pool because that's where all the food was. And, And by the way, at every party, there's always like the epicenter the middle where all the extroverts are hanging out. You know, that's like where Doug and Ethan always are, always making everybody laugh. And what you may not know is that every party, there's always the epicenter. And then there's like these little pockets that us introverts like to retreat to. Some of you are looking at me right now like, that's not true. Yes, it is. You just don't notice because you're always in the middle. Observe next time you're at a party, there's the, the middle and then there's these places because Doug and E are always in the middle, but I like to be a little bit more mobile, you know? Like I like to dive into the middle and make some jokes, but then I always duck out because in that middle, it just drains my social battery a little bit too quickly, it, you know? And so all around the party, there's these pockets of introverts hanging out. And by the way, if you'd ever like to join us, you're always welcome. The only password to get into the introvert party is just a deep exhale. All you have to do is go, <sighs> and we'll go, yeah, I get it. Come on in. You can just stand right here. You don't have to say a word. It's all good. Just recharge, you know? Introverts, I'm giving away all of our secrets right now. I'm sorry. Well, I'm at this, this barbecue and Oliver sees that and he's like, hey, let's go check out my gym in my garage. And I'm like, absolutely. Let's get out of this craziness and let's go check out the gym. Now, I've got a gym in my garage, but Oliver has like a gym in his garage. You know what I mean? Like there's levels to this. We walk into his garage and he has everything you could ever need. And we're walking around looking at it. Then we get to the, the pull-up bar. And I just tell him offhanded, I go, hey man, I've actually, I've never been good at pull-ups. And and he looked at me and he goes, okay, great. Tell me about your pull-up routine. And I said, hey, I don't know if you heard what I said. I've never been good at pull-ups. I don't do pull-ups. And without skipping a beat, he goes, maybe that's why you're not good at them. And I thought, huh, that's a really good point. Like I drove home thinking, maybe that's why I'm not good at them. And the next morning I started trying to do some pull-ups and it didn't go great. And the day after that, I started trying to do some pull-ups and it still didn't go great. But like a week later, I started to make a little bit of progress. And the week after that, I made a little bit more progress. And on Friday morning, I was in Oliver's garage and we were doing a workout that requires a lot of pull-ups and got it done. And we were in his pool afterwards laughing about that statement I made a year ago where I just kind of assumed, no, you know what, pull-ups, they're not for me. I'm just going to make excuses. And he, with one sentence, gave me this aha moment that I want you to have today. Because here's the deal. It's so common to make excuses. You know what's uncommon? is to take ownership. Well, I'm just not good at prayer. Okay. Tell me about your prayer routine. I don't know if you heard what I said. I'm not good at prayer. I don't pray. Maybe that's why you're not good at prayer. Well, I just don't like to talk to my coworkers about Jesus because there's all these questions, you know, that I know they're going to ask and I don't know the answers to those questions. Fine, fair. There's also a ton of resources online for you to learn answers to those questions. So what are you doing? Well, you know, the intellectual stuff, it just doesn't really come naturally to me. Maybe it's time to start applying yourself. Maybe it's time to stop making excuses and start taking uncommon ownership over your spiritual walk. And so today, uh, I want to preach a very simple message called Uncommon Ownership. 
Now it's simple, but simple doesn't always mean easy. And so turn over to Numbers chapter 13 if you have your Bible. And I want to walk us through a, a story of uncommon ownership. Now to catch you up, some context. God's people are, are, find themselves in Egypt. They're slaves. And then Moses, God raises up Moses, brings them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. And they go to Mount Sinai and they, they get the Ten Commandments. They get the 613 uh, uh, laws. And they're heading toward the promised land. They're like a year into the journey. They're making great time. And then in Numbers 13, we're about to find out why what should be really an 11-day journey turns into a 40-year journey of wandering in the wilderness. Now, I've been reading these chapters over and over again this week. As I've been reading, uh, I've been noticing that there's really three main ingredients in this story to living an uncommon, or to taking uncommon ownership over your life. Now, there's probably more, and as you read it this week, I want you to, to come up with more I'm a pretty simple guy, okay? I'm like, you know when, when you have a meal with somebody and you're like, hey, that ahi salad, that was so good. Can you send me that recipe? And then they send you the recipe and it's like 20 ingredients. And you're like, I, I was looking for like three ingredients, you know? And they're always like, well, you gotta get the greens from Whole Foods, but then you gotta go to H-E-B to get the ahi. I'm always like, you lost me. I'm a one-stop shop kind of guy, you know? <laughs> like, I don't even like going to one store. I'm not gonna go to two stores for one meal. That just doesn't compute in my mind. They're always like, yeah, and then you get the olives and you get cucumbers and you, you, you get the, the avocado. And then they always say this, and the trick is you got to make your own dressing. <laughs> like super simple. You just, you, you, you're going to get three tablespoons of, of vinegar and two tablespoons of soy sauce and one tablespoon of, of ginger. And then you're going to add a little bit of honey. And this is the part that everybody misses. Add a little bit of honey, not a lot of honey, but a little bit of honey. And then you put your salt and your pepper. And I just look at it. I'm like, look, I believe you. Okay. <laughs> I really do. I believe that it tastes better. I believe that it's healthier. I believe that it's more cost effective. It's just like I have a life to live, you know? And I don't just have those ingredients lying around. I'm a pretty simple guy. And I say all that to say this today. I just want to give you three ingredients to what it looks like to take uncommon ownership over your life. And so with that, let's read the Bible. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send out one of its leaders. Now, the Israelites were one people, but they were broken into 12 tribes. Like we, as the United States, are one nation, but have 50 states. And each of those tribes have their own leaders. And so Moses oversees all of it. And he goes, hey, so I want you to pick one representative, one scout, from each tribe, and the 12 of you are going to go scout this land that we are heading toward. Jump down to verse 17, and Moses tells them how to do it. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Listen to all these questions he tells them to, to look for. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. I love that the Bible adds this. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. <laughs> Moses is like, if they got grapes, grab some grapes on your way back. <laughs> so he sends them out and for 40 days, they go and scout this land. And by the way, this one's for free. This doesn't count as one of our ingredients. But if you have a big decision that you have to make, and maybe your step today is to take uncommon ownership of that decision and stop putting it off, here's the first step. Go scout the land. Go investigate. Go, go uh, gather all the information you need in order to make the decision. I talk to people in the lobby all the time who are like, I, I got this, this new job offer and it's in this new city and I just don't know if I should take it. And the first question I ask is, okay, do you like the city? They go, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. It's like, well, you should learn about it. You should go scout the land. Well, I can't afford it. Get online. Google what's the weather like at the end of September. Does this city have a fall or does it just stay really hot until it then freezes for a couple of days, you know? 
Hey, when I drink my pumpkin spice latte at the end of September, like I should, will it feel authentic or will it feel inauthentic? (laughs) This morning, just for about an hour, there's a little bit of fall here in Austin. And Lord, we just pray for increase. (laughs) That's all. Scout, ask questions. Hey, what's the salary at this new job? I don't know. Maybe I should find out. Yeah, you should probably find out. It's like we try to make decisions uh, without having all of the information. It's like trying to to build a puzzle without having all the pieces on the table. Uh, For some of you, very, very simply, your job this week is to investigate, to go scout out the decision that you are trying to make. So these 12 guys head out for 40 days. Now, uh, two of them you have probably heard of. Ten of them, I bet you have not heard of. The two of them are are Joshua, who gets a whole book named after him, and another guy named Caleb. The other ten, I'll be honest, I don't even remember their names. And here's why. It's because ten of them made a lot of very common excuses, and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, took uncommon ownership. Let's read. Verse 27. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. So they come back after 40 days, and they've got good news. We got some grapes for you, Moses. But then there's bad news. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So, so 10 of the scouts come back and they go, we can't do this. They're too big. It's not going to happen. Oh, we need to just quit now, but then verse 30 is so important. Then Caleb silenced, I love that verb, silence. He shows up with authority. He silenced the people before Moses and said, no, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Caleb stands up and he's like, remember how literally less than a year ago God parted the Red Sea? Have we already forgotten how amazing this God is that we serve? Like we can do this thing. We can take uncommon ownership of this, this uh, decision in front of us and go do this thing, but it doesn't go very well. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. That's pre-flood giants back in Genesis 6. If we go too far down that rabbit trail, we won't get to the rest of the sermon. Another day. We seemed like grasshoppers. Get this. Here's their report. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So they start spreading this report around, uh, uh, around to all the Israelites that we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Now, it's true that there were giants in the land. It's true that the, the people in the land were bigger than them. But grasshoppers? The average grasshopper is 100 milligrams. The average human is 62 kilograms. Or since this is America, 136 pounds. That means that the average human is 620,000 times bigger than a grasshopper. And so were there giants in the land? Yes. Did they make them look like grasshoppers? No. In order for them to look like grasshoppers, that means the giants would have to be 800 and, or, I'm sorry, 84 million pounds. So of course this is hyperbole. Uh, of course they're going, no, they're just big. Hey, but you know how fear spreads, right? Uh, like think about how that, that information gets passed down. And suddenly a family is sitting around a fire going, did you know that we're going to be like grasshoppers compared to them? And the two people are going to get water and they're like, yeah, we're going to be like grasshoppers compared to them. Fear spreads, man. Bad news spreads. This happens today. I I, I hear it all the time. There's one I've been hearing for the last couple of decades. Oh, the church is in decline. People are, are, are losing faith in God. People are walking away from church. And for years, my response has been, come and see. 
That's not actually true. I was just up in my office praying over this service a few minutes ago and overflow started showing up. Like overflow started overflowing and I looked around going, doesn't seem like it to me. Oh, but bad news and fear is easy to spread in the media, right? That's why it's so important that we get together in rooms with real people and have real conversations. It's just in the last few years, the media has finally started to catch on to something that we have been saying for years. Like, actually, it kind of seems like people are going back to church. We're like, yeah, no, we have been ringing that bell for a long time. I read an article this week that said, and Gen Z men are starting to show back up to church, which is something that we've been praying for for a decade. And hey, we're so proud of you and we believe in you because we believe that, that just like Joshua and, and Caleb taking ownership extreme, uncommon ownership of, of your faith that you are going to take this whole thing further than we ever could. And we want you to know, Gen Z, we've got your back. We're so proud of you. Hey, but you know how fear starts to spread, right? And so they start to go, hey, we're gonna be like grasshoppers. And we'll pick up the story in verse four. Numbers 14, verse four, verse three, I'm sorry. Here's what the people are saying. Why is the Lord bringing us up to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will, will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? They said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. That's, first off, leadership lesson 101 for anyone who wants to be a leader. Read the Bible. It's, it's a difficult job. We should choose a leader and go back Egypt. For the record, that was slavery. That means day by day, you're building brick by brick in order to build more monuments for a tyrannical leader who thought he was a god. That's what they want. That's the offer. Verse five, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. And here we go. Joshua and Caleb who were among those who had explored the land. Here's our two scouts who took uncommon ownership. Tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. They're going, listen, God told us we can do this. We can do this, but we got to trust God. We got to trust that we got to keep our faith in the Lord. And then we got to take some uncommon ownership and step up to the plate. This is our time. But the people don't listen. And in fact, this is like a year into their 40 year journey. Do you know why it takes 40 years through wandering in the wilderness? Because they're not ready because that generation doesn't have the faith. If you jump down to verse 23, this is the Lord speaking now. Not one of them will ever see the land, I promise, on oath of their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But, verse 24, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, underline those two words, different spirit. Gen Z, different spirit and follows me, here's how you have a different spirit, wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. And, and so the reason it takes 40 years is because they spend the next 40 years just wandering in the wilderness until it's only Caleb and Joshua and then the next generation who are ready to enter into the promised land. And so my question for you today is, are you ready to be a Caleb or a Joshua? Are you ready to live uncommon? You know it's common to live common? Everybody's doing it. You have an invitation on the table right now, ladies at Lane Murray Unit, to live an uncommon life, to live with uncommon love and uncommon grace and uncommon forgiveness as you step into the uncommon calling that your uncommon God has laid out before you. Oh, but it's your job to say, no, I'm gonna take ownership of my life. And so... The three ingredients that I saw in, in that story starts like this. Number one, agency. We have to realize that we have agency over our life. 
Genesis 2, verse 15, is one of those verses that is so easy to skip over in the creation story, but it's one of my favorites. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So the creator of the universe creates all of this, and then he goes, all right, Adam, you're up. I want you to go into the garden, and I want you to take care of it. He just created all of it. He doesn't need help pulling weeds. God could handle this on his own if he wanted, but he doesn't. He decides to invite humans into the story and then gives us agency to take it somewhere. Do you see how important that is? Like you have agency over your life. God placed you here and said, hey, I want you to take it somewhere. You have agency over your family. You have agency over your household. You have agency over your classroom. You have agency over your workplace. You have agency to step up and take this thing somewhere. You just have to realize it. And it's so hard to realize it because in Genesis 3, they give that agency right back, don't they? They go eat the fruit that they're not supposed to eat and then immediately, oh, it's her fault. Oh, it's his fault. Oh, it's the serpent's fault. Oh, God, it's the serpent that you gave us fault. They just immediately start giving their agency away. Move back to a place of of being disempowered and going, yeah, no, just excuse after excuse, blame after blame. So it is with every human sense. We know that we have agency, but it's so easy to forget. And so you want to get back into shape and then you go, yeah, but you know, the guy that was going to work out with me, he never texted me back. It's not my fault. It's his fault. It's like, no, it's your fault. You're just refusing to take agency over your life. How about this one? Oh yeah, sorry I said that. I've got no filter. First off, yes, you do. Everybody has a filter. You just don't work on yours. You don't take agency over your filter. Uh, how, how about this instead? Hey, I'm sorry I said that. Sometimes when I say things, I don't think about how it's going to affect other people and hurt their feelings. At least you're being honest at that point. At least you're taking agency over it. Uh, at least you're going, no, it's time for me to get better. It's time for me to not make that joke next time. It's my favorite when somebody is, is starting to say something and then I see them stop. I go, yes, good, good. <laughs> Keep working on that. I'm preaching to myself sometimes too. We can learn how to have a filter. We just have to realize that we have more agency over the things we say than we realize. How about this one? Ah, oh, scripture, you know, I'm just, I'm never really gonna know it. It's not really my thing. I'm not good at the intellectual stuff. 16 years ago, on a Tuesday night in Boulder, Colorado, a pastor named Jenny stood up and she preached uh, one of the most simple and yet most profound sermons that I've ever heard, still think about it all the time. She got up and she said, "Um, you know, I grew up playing sports and what coaches would always say is if we want to get stronger, we need to lift things over our head. So her entire illustration was if you want to get better at being more like Jesus, you have to get into the word. You have to, to get your Bible and read it. And that's like going to the gym and lifting heavy things. And it was so simple. And I sat there and I was like, that makes so much sense to me. Like I can do that. Speaking my language. And they had these, these maroon study Bibles uh, available for anyone who was like, no, I really want to start taking this seriously. And so I picked this up 16 years ago and I took it to my group and I was like, hey guys, I'm so new to all this, but I, I want to learn how, how to read the, the Bible and, and I want to understand what, what is in here. And so this guy named Ethan was like, hey, me too. Why don't we read the book of Acts together and we'll, we'll text each other what, what we see. And this guy named Doug was like, hey, me too. Why don't we read Mark together and we'll text each other? Like some of those original texts were were like, hey, did you see that John the Baptist ate locusts? You know, like that's where we were at. We were just like, like step one. My buddy Chris was like, hey, let's read Romans together. Okay. And, And soon enough, I'm starting to read the books in the Bible. And 16 years later, I've just never stopped. I keep this by my bed. Every night, and, and oftentimes, here's a good trick. I open it before I go to sleep to the passage that I wanna be in in the morning because how many know in the morning you're ready to make every excuse imaginable? And so take those excuses away. Have it be open for you, and before you get to your phone, go to the Word, even if it's just for a, a few minutes. What I'm telling you is you can do this. 
I, that summer, I took this to, to Costa Rica. I started leading mission trips, and I would lead these like 10-day trips um, throughout the summer, and this is the only Bible I had. And so every time I'd go out on the 10-day trip, I'd have this little backpack, and I'd put the Bible in the backpack, and it would take up like 80% of the room in my backpack. So then I'd have like two other shirts, and I'd be like, all right, let's go. My buddy Dan one day was like, hey, we can get you like a travel Bible too. You know, like there's other ways to do this. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm new to this. I'm, I'm a novice. I'm a beginner. You know, like I'm, I'm just starting out. And can I say, I think we need to get better at the statement, hey, I'm a beginner. I'm new to this. Can you help me? You know, it's okay to be a beginner, whether it's the Bible or anything else in life. I feel like what happens is we go to school and we're always learning, learning new things. And then we graduate and we start working. And it's really easy to find our one thing that we get really good at. And that's great. Have your craft. There's financial benefit to being really good at something. Also, make sure you're learning other things. Because the problem is we get really good at that thing. And then the part of our brain that's in charge of learning new things just kind of takes a nap. And before you know it, we have, there's another skill or another hobby or another thing that, that we want to learn, but we go, yeah, but like, I don't know, maybe I'm too old for that, you know, or like, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at this thing, so do I really want to be a beginner at that other thing? And to which I say, yes, you have agency over your life, step up and be okay with being a beginner at things, you got to start somewhere. If you want to have uncommon ownership over your life, you got to realize that you have agency. That's the first ingredient. Now, ingredient number two is accountability. Do you notice that Caleb and Joshua were in this together? I love when I read the, the story that it's 10 verse 2, not 11 verse 1. 10 verse 2 is tough, but 11 verse 1 is far tougher. It's so important to have other people with you. Like, like we don't get a whole lot of details uh, about their, their 40 days as they're scouting out the land, but I would imagine they're having conversations. Like, this place is amazing. Also, we gotta tell them we can't, we can't do this, right? Like, we gotta tell them no. And, and, and Caleb is over there like, no, we gotta tell them yes. And thank God it's not just Caleb and the other, versus the other 11. Thank God Caleb has Joshua to look to his right and going like, hey, we can do this, right? You remember what the Lord told us. Like, I'm not crazy, right? No, you're not crazy, right? Let's, let's, let's move forward. Let's go take the, the, this land. It's so important that we are in this together. Accountability. I love how Proverbs 27, 17 says it. It says, just as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so another person sharpens another. And so two questions. Do you sharpen others? When people spend time in your presence, do they leave ready to be more like Jesus? When people show up to a group that you're at, do they leave ready to be more like Jesus? Or do they just show up and go, oh yeah, pretty unaffected. Are you somebody who sharpens other people? Here's a line I've been using and feel free to borrow it, but if you're gonna borrow it, make sure you get the tone right because the tone's really important. It's just that over the years, I've had so many like weekly check-ins with people that sound exactly the same. Oh, good week, but I'm, I'm still struggling with that thing. But you know, this week, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better this week. I got it this week. And the next week rolls around. Yeah, still struggling with that one thing, but you know, I'm, this week's gonna be different. Next week, yeah, still struggling. It's like, it's like a rerun. So here's the line that I've been using. When I have relational equity built up with somebody, in love, what I say is, I don't believe you. And it's a way to, to stop them from getting caught on this infinite rerun that they're stuck in because I go, no, I actually think that next week you're gonna have the same exact check-in that you had this week. And I say it in love because what I'm really saying is I want you to prove me wrong. It's just I don't believe you yet. We were, uh, I was, talking to Doug about this sermon. And I was like, I, I'm just so frustrated sometimes that it's like there's 12 scouts in the land and only two of them come back with a good report. And Doug goes, no, that sounds about right. It's usually about two out of 12. He, he said, he's like, two out of 12 people will hear what you're saying in the sermon and actually apply it. 10 out of, 10 out of 12 will just continue to, to live common. And that's so true. And I say that with nothing but love to say this, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Realize that you actually can take ownership over your life and make this week different. Are you somebody that sharpens other people? 
And the follow-up, and just as fair, is are you willing to be sharpened? When somebody comes to you with something, there's three ways to respond. The first is to avoid it. Go, ah, you just don't understand. The second is to get angry and try to, try to get defensive. The third is at a very secure level. Go, okay, yeah, I hear, I hear what you're saying. Thank you for saying that. I want to get better. Can we get better together? Accountability is so important. But, but here's the deal. They can't keep you accountable for something that they don't know about. That's why James 5.17 says this, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing follows confession. I've seen it so many times in my life. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you sharpen others? Are you willing to be sharpened? And do they know if they're keeping you accountable, do they know what they're keeping you accountable for? Hey, not everybody needs to know everything going on in your life, but somebody should. So be smart about it, but also be brave and bold about it. We need accountability. Finally, final ingredient to this, if we want to live uncommon ownership, have uncommon ownership over our lives, we're going to need agency. We're going to need accountability. The third thing I see in the story is action. Now, action is different than agency. Agency is the revelation. Action is the activation. Agency is Oliver saying, hey, maybe that's why you're not good at pull-ups. Action is all the pull-ups that I've done ever since. You see the difference? You got to have both. There's the aha moment, and then there's the moment where you you take a step, and you you actually start taking some some action. Uh, Doug, again, was we were were talking about the sermon, and he goes, yeah, you know what my least favorite word is? He said the word almost. I thought, yeah, that's so true, isn't it? (laughs) I almost prayed for you. Well, I was almost generous. Oh, we almost built a church that almost changed the city. Like, hey, thank God Jesus didn't almost pay the price for our sins. I don't want to be an almost church. I want to be a church of action. Almost is the enemy of action. I, uh, Pastor Sean in Denver was preaching about prayer last week in community. And he's, he's made such a good point. He goes, I'm so tired of praying or, or texting somebody, hey, would you pray for me? And then you just get the prayer emoji back. <laughs> and they always send it like three seconds later. It's like, you didn't pray for me. You just sent the prayer emoji. <laughs> he goes, how about this? How about you call them and you pray for them? How about you go see them and you pray for them? How about we don't almost pray for people? How about we stop and pray for people? Here's an embarrassing one for you. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was, I was running through my neighborhood and I was, I was thinking about Hebrews 12, talking about throw off everything that so easily entangles. And we're gonna read it in just a second. And I'm running and I'm, I'm, the verse is about running. And so it was, it was on my mind. And I realized like, hey, here's a good step for me today. Like I need to go up to my closet and I need to go get all the shirts that I'm not wearing and even some of the shirts that I do want to wear and give them away because there's other people that absolutely need them. And so I, I get home from the run and I go up to my closet with two trash bags. That was my goal. And, and I start taking the shirts down. I fold them up all nice and neat and I put them in the garbage bags and I carry the two garbage bags down to my garage and put them there. <laughs> this week, I was like, maybe I should tell people to go, go give away so my clothes, and I, and I just felt <laughs> such a strong conviction from the Holy Spirit, like, oh yeah, really? Why don't you walk down to your garage? I go down to my garage, the clothes are still just sitting there. That's not me being generous. That's me being almost generous. That's not me being generous. That's me rearranging my stinginess. All I did is I moved my stinginess from my closet to my garage. Whoever this is for, it doesn't count as generosity until the person who actually needs it has it. Hey, I don't want to be an almost generous church. I want to be a generous church. Uh, I want to be a church that goes, no, we're going to err on the side of action because we have agency over our life and accountability. And so let's step into this together and actually take steps of faith today. I was driving here early uh, yesterday to get ready for the sermon and the entire facilities team uh, was, was here early with all of the trash cans from our entire campus out and they, were, they had the hose out and they were cleaning it all out. 
and I, and I, I was watching them do it, and, and, and I was thinking about it like, they're not doing that because we asked them to do that. They're doing that because they realize they have agency over this place and that there's a need. Hey, because I, I love you guys. You throw a lot of half-drank coffee cups away. You know what I mean? And so those garbage cans, they get really gross. And so, so this facility team, they were just like, hey, we can do something about this. Like we have agency and ownership over this. And so they, they spend their entire Saturday, a very hot Saturday at the end of fall. I wanted to preach in a hoodie today and I just felt like I couldn't. That's why I'm so bitter about the weather. I don't know, pray for me. They show up and, and they wash out all of the trash cans and I'm watching them do this. And I go, that's what I'm trying to communicate this weekend is, is when you see a need, you can actually take ownership over it and step up and do something about it. But what's common is to make excuses. Well, you know, so-and-so should really be doing more about that. So it's the, the government should be doing more about that. The church should be doing more about that. Yeah, okay, probably fair. And you can do something about it too. So what does it look like for you to step up and have uncommon ownership over the needs that you see in the world. I want to be a church of action. I want to be a church that, that doesn't just talk about maybe almost one day loving our city, but, but instead be a church that, that is loving our city with everything that we got. Now, that takes us to our, our, our final passage, Joshua 14. Um, Caleb stands up and he goes, hey, we can do this. We can take uncommon ownership over our lives. Nobody else is ready for it. And what I love, I, I noticed this for the first time the, this week, is that in Joshua 14, we get a snapshot into Caleb's life 45 years later. And uh, I, I was preaching this yesterday, and my parents were, were here. And my mom pulled me aside right after I got down, and she goes, hey, Joshua 14, you better preach that. That's important. They need to hear that. She goes, I needed to hear that. And so here we go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Joshua 14. Verse seven, this is Caleb talking. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. You remember that story because we just went through it. Caleb's going, I was 40 years old at that point. I, however, have followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. There's our word again. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Get this, verse 10. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was back then. Caleb is a man of action. And 45 years later, we see him at 85 going, yeah, back then I was ready to take the next hill that the Lord has for us. And guess what? Today at 85, I'm just as strong and just as ready to take this hill that the Lord has for us. What an amazing North Star. What an amazing vision for your future. I was reading that and I was thinking like, like hey, I want to be the guy at 85 who's still preaching with just as much passion that the Lord can do this. And that the Lord is ready to move in this city and that heaven is going to get more crowded. Uh, like for, for the one who feels like your ministry is done and you've kind of given your time, what if your ministry was just getting started? except now you're going into it with more wisdom and more experience. To, to the parent in this room who is now an empty nester, maybe for the, the first time in 18 or 25 years, hey, I bet you you had some dreams, some goals back then that you have had to, and rightfully so, put on the back burner. And thank you for that. Because it says in, in Genesis 1 and 2, we're here to, to be fruitful and multiply and raise up the next generation and well done. And now what I want to say is what's next? What's coming? What is the Lord getting you ready for that you are now ready to step into again with more wisdom 
And, and as time starts to be a resource that you have, again, what could it be that God is asking you to do in this city and in this world? Caleb was 85 going, no, I'm still ready. I'm, I'm still working every single day. I'm still, I'm still taking these hills that the Lord is calling me to take. That's who I want to be, man. That's who I want us to be. But it's going to take uncommon ownership. It's common to be common. It's uncommon to go, I take ownership, and I realize that I have agency and accountability, and so I'm going to be a man or a woman who takes action. Amen? If you guys stand to your feet, if you are able, we're going to end this the, the only way I know how, by fixing our eyes back on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our, our faith. And in fact, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. We've been there every, every week so far in this series. Let's read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 again. Let the word of God speak to you today. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, hey, Joshua and Caleb, for example, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. That phrase is for somebody. Consider him. What are you going to do this week when you're trying to take ownership of your life, but you're growing weary? Consider him. Fix your eyes back on Jesus. Consider what Jesus did for you. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer of Hebrews is going, hey, for such a time as this, there is a race that is marked out for you. But if you want to live an uncommon life, it's going to take some uncommon ownership. And how are you going to do that? You're going to fix your eyes on Jesus. You're going to fix your eyes on the ultimate example of ownership. You realize that, right? Hey, every single one of us in this room, watching online, ladies at Lane Murray Unit, every single one of us have something in common. We're a part of the sin problem. It's my fault. It's all of our faults, imperfect people. We've all fallen short. We're all a part of the sin problem, except there's one person who didn't contribute to the sin problem at all. His name's Jesus. It's the only person in human history who can say with integrity, no, that's not my fault. And yet in the greatest act of love of all time, the only one who can say that's not my fault said, it is my responsibility though. And so I will step out of heaven to come be with you. I will go to the cross scorning its shame with joy set before me for you. And that's extreme, uncommon ownership. That's a picture of somebody who goes, no, I'm not just going to make excuses. I'm actually going to own it, and I'm going to go way further than I even need to to take uncommon responsibility for people that I have an uncommon love for. Hey, that's who Jesus is. And if you're new to all of this, would you just know that's what Jesus thinks of you? And if you've heard stories like this for, for decades, would you know once again, that's what Jesus thinks about you? He goes, I got that. I'll, I'll pick up the tab for your sin problem, put it, put it on my shoulders. I got it, I'll go to the cross for you that you may go free. And now we fix our attention on the beautiful name of Jesus and we go, let that truth spur us on to go live an uncommon life in this city, amen. Father, we love you so much. Jesus, thank you. Amen. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't your fault, but you made it your responsibility. And so we gather here today to fix our attention back on you and say, we thank you that you went to the cross on Friday and we thank you that on Sunday, the grave could not hold you. 
and that you are alive and active and ready to move in this place, ready to move up and overflow, ready to move all around this world, ready to move at the Lane Murray unit. And so Father, right now we ask in the name of Jesus that you would break off chains of fear, that you would break off chains of regret, and that you would fill minds and souls with uncommon ownership. Lord, would you remind people right now that they have agency to get back up and that they have accountability to get back up and that they can take some action steps today to be different, to live an uncommon life with an uncommon calling in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hey, Red Rocks, let's worship.